I've spent the last two weeks, both in the nine and the noon service, talking about hunger. I've been talking about hunger. I've been talking about the necessity for hunger when it comes to God and the things of God. That God responds to hunger. God responds to hunger. He doesn't simply respond to inquiry. <laughs> so let me just go to church and just see. He doesn't respond to inquiry as much as he responds to hunger. And as it relates to worship, hunger is an absolute necessity to birth a deep, rich worship life. That you must be hungry for God, not for stuff. See, see, you got to understand, we're not seeking stuff. You don't you don't you don't even need God to get stuff. All you need is a job. Get a job, you can get some stuff. Okay? So you don't need God for that. But when you get God, when you get the blesser, then he will give you blessings. So we don't seek his hand. That's the blessing. We seek his face. And I, I pray that your hunger for God is beginning to grow in this season Amen. to grow. Now, I told you last week that this is not your typical, ordinary teaching on worship, which, you know, we talk about how to worship, how to sing, how to move, what to do, you know. And that's what people are used to uh, in worship series. Um, but many of the things that the Lord has given me um, is not necessarily the mechanics of worship, but it's really the things that take your worship from deep to deeper, from good to great, so that you can really experience God in ways that you've never experienced him before. Let's look at Psalm 16 and 11. So this is the fourth message in this series, Next Level Worship. Today, I, I'm really just going to lay foundation. I'm not going to go deep. I'm just going to lay foundation for where I'm going to go next week. Today, I want to begin to talk about the subject, the presence of God. The presence of God. Not the presence, P-R-E-S-E-N-T-S. -E -E Not the presence of God, but the presence of God. P-R-E-S-E-N-C-E. -E, the presence of God. If you found Psalm 16 and 11, indicate by saying, I have it. The Bible reads, you reveal the path of life to me. In your presence is abundant joy. In your right hand are eternal pleasures. Revelation from the word is supposed to draw us into an encounter with God. Revelation from the word is supposed to draw us into an encounter with God. So when we look at this word in Psalms 11, it gives us an opportunity to experience revelation. Revelation. And so today I pray that the Lord would give us revelation on his presence. His presence. We were not designed to be classroom Christians. Mm -hmm. 
We were not designed to be classroom Christians. What do I mean? How many of you sat in some class at some point in your life and said, I will never use this? Why am I in this class? I will never do calculus. I will never use this for anything. Come on, somebody talk to me. You, 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 and you just like, I don't understand why this is necessary, why I have to take this, why I have to go through this, because I am not going to use this. And many of you have held true to that. You ain't used half of nothing you've learned in school. You are back down to addition and subtraction. And don't ask you to multiply or to divide because you're going to take your phone out here. Let me, I, I didn't forgot the tables. I don't remember how. <laughs> addition and subtraction is about the best you, you got, no matter how high you went regarding math. C come on. Yes. Amen. Till you have kids. Listen. You be like, they teaching y'all this in the second grade. <laughs> Jesus, I didn't learn this till till 10th grade. <laughs> we were not designed to be classroom Christians. We were designed to be experiential Christians. God gives us his word as an invitation. When is the last time you took a message as an invitation to something more? I'm not talking about sitting in church taking good notes that you're not going to go back and look at. Right. <laughs> I, I'm not talking about sitting in church and being intellectually stimulated. I'm not even talking about inspiration. Because how many of you know that all of those things are short lived? But experiences stay with you. <laughs> experiences stay with you. When I think about the Apostle Paul, I think about a man who was uh, of the upper echelon of the religious system of the Jews. Not only was he in the upper echelon of the religious system of the Jews, he was smart. Yeah, he was. Yeah, yeah. History records that Paul was not bilingual, he was multilingual. Yep, yep. Hallelujah. Some of us think we're bilingual because we speak English and Pig Latin. <laughs> No, Paul was able to speak several languages fluently, history records. And Paul was a devout Jew. He was a devout Hebrew. But he was blind. He saw, but he didn't see. <laughs> and so Paul took up the mission to stamp out this heretical new group of people called Christians that were springing up everywhere to stamp them out, to bring them down, to arrest them, and yes, even kill them over doctrinal differences. Hmm. Paul was devout. Somebody say Paul was devout. Paul was devout. And it was one thing that changed Paul's heart. It was not a message. Nobody preached eloquently to Paul. You couldn't out scripture him anyway. couldn't out scripture Paul. Paul was a teacher of the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. You couldn't out scripture him. You couldn't out doctrinalize him. You couldn't get one over on Paul. Paul was so smart y'all still don't understand his writings. 
We're still scratching our heads trying to figure out what did Paul mean by this? But as Paul was on his way to Damascus to do what he had been doing, which was shutting down Christians, arresting them, having them killed, one thing changed Paul's life, an encounter. An encounter with the resurrected Christ. The one that the Jews denied. They denied that he rose. They suggested that his missing body was his followers, stole his body. So that they could propagate this lie that he rose. And Paul was of the belief of the Jews. That this man, Jesus, had not rose. But a bright light met Paul on the road to Damascus. And it was so bright that it knocked Paul from his beast. And not only did it knock him from his beast, it blinded him. But this light had a voice. And this light called his name. And asked him a question, why, Saul, are you persecuting me? And Saul says, Lord, who are you? Interesting, interesting language. Who are you? And he says, I am Jesus, who you persecute. It was not an intellectual discourse that changed Paul's life. And the problem with many of us as believers is that we have been having intellectual discourses, intellectual, but no experience. I'm going to tell you right now, the reason I'm still saved today has nothing to do with the best messages I've heard. Because I've heard some of the best messages and some of the best preachers out here. The reason I'm still walking with the Lord is because I experienced him. You can't come to me and tell me nothing about uh, the Da Vinci Code. You can't come to me and tell me anything about, well, the Bible was written by men. You can't come to me and tell me it's Allah and tell me it's Buddha because I've had an experience. God met me one day. Mm. God met me in a real way. God, God, I wasn't simply convicted by some preacher. I didn't simply feel bad about my life. I didn't simply look at my life and say, well, I guess I'll try Jesus because it's in a mess. One day, Jesus showed himself to me. One day, he gave me an experience that cannot be taken from me. I would suggest the issue with some of us Is that we have information, but no experience. We have the word of God. But we've not experienced the God of the word. See, it's not simply the word of God that changes your life, but it's the it's the God of the word encountering your life that changes your life. What sets Christianity apart from every other religion? We're set apart because we serve a living God. We're set apart because we don't pray to a God who does not answer. We're set apart because we don't worship a God who is a statue or in any graven image. We don't worship a God who is only thought and intellect and who requires belief with no proof. He's a God that proves himself. 
who am I talking to? Who has met this God? The God that proves himself. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He proves himself. He's, he's made himself real. Hallelujah. 1 Corinthians 4 and 20 says this. For the kingdom of God does not consist in words. But in power. This is the Apostle Paul communicating to the people at Corinth. That the kingdom of God is not talk. Do you know why many of us are not convinced of God? Because all we got is talk. God heals. We don't see healing. God delivers, but we don't see deliverance. God has an anointing, but we don't sense the anointing. But the kingdom of God is not in words. It's not consist in words, but in power. Paul in another place said that I don't come to you with the enticing words of men's wisdom, but in power and demonstration. Paul had access to something. That was greater than his theology. That was greater than his ability to memorize scriptures. For many of us have memorized scriptures that we don't really believe. Because if we really believe the word of God, our lives would reflect what we say we believe. Paul had something greater. He had the presence of God. Can we talk about the presence of God for just a little bit? Yes. The scriptures often speak of God's presence in humanity and out throughout human history. The most common Hebrew term for presence is panim, which is also translated Face, implying a close and personal encounter with the Lord. As a matter of fact, in our text that we read in Psalms, the word presence there means face. It means face. The presence of proximity of someone understood in terms of the face with the implication of being before or in front of them. So what does this mean? This means that God is not a grand idea. That your God is not simply a concept or philosophy. That your God has the power and the ability to reveal himself. When we talk about the presence of God, we are literally talking about the manifest, the manifested characteristics of God. When you enter into the presence of God, when he begins to manifest himself in your midst, it is literally God revealing his face. It is literally God showing himself. Why? Why is this significant? Why is this important with regards to worship? It's important with regards to worship because worship is one of the ways we attract presence. Mm -hmm. Now, the Bible says in Acts 17, the A clause, for in him, 1728, for in him we live and move and exist. 
Now, I want to back up and I want to I want to make a couple of qualifying statements that the presence of the Lord is everywhere. The presence of the Lord is everywhere. That should make some of us feel some kind of way. Because you live like the presence of the Lord is there only at church. How would your life change if you would acknowledge the fact that God is everywhere you are? God is everywhere you go. God hears every conversation you have. He even knows your thoughts are far off. The presence of the Lord is everywhere. God is not there and not here or here and not there. God is there and here and there too. The presence of the Lord. The difference in this is that the, this presence is concealed from us. That we don't always sense or we're not always aware of this presence. This is the presence that holds the universe together. This is the presence that causes atoms and molecules not to break apart and pull apart. This is the presence that stops the sun from spiraling out of control and the earth from flinging out into space. This is the. This is this is the invisible presence of the Lord. Oh, God. Colossians 1 and 17 says he is before all things and by him all things hold together or all things consist. Somebody say the presence of the Lord. So the presence of the Lord is is everywhere, though we don't always perceive it to be everywhere. He's everywhere. He's everywhere at the same time. And he's in heaven. It's called omni presence. He's everywhere. Come on, look at your neighbor and say, he's everywhere. He's ev Don't you doubt it. Don't you doubt it. Don't you doubt it. The, the, the writer said, I looked to my left and I didn't see him. I looked to my right. I couldn't perceive God. I didn't know where he was. But trust and believe that even when you cannot feel him, even when you cannot perceive him, even when you cannot seem to uh, generate a goosebump, God is there. He's always present. We are just not, we're not always aware of his presence. Yes, sir. Now, when we talk about this presence of God in a worship content context, what, what we're talking about is now what was hidden becomes manifest. Yeah. What we were unable to detect or unaware of, we now become acutely aware that God is here. And so we've developed a lot of church things and a lot of church. God is moving. You heard me talk about it last week, that if God were to move from here to there, there would not exist anymore. So is God really moving? No, God is manifesting. God is revealing himself. Oh, God, help me teach this. God is, God is revealing himself. The psalmist said in 139 and 7, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? Oh, God. Why, why, why 
is this issue of the presence so important? It's so important to the life of the believer because God desires for us to be aware of his presence. Yes, preacher, why is this important to me? Why should I care about this, this issue? It is in the presence of the Lord that we experience in a tangible way the living God. Now, uh, just by a show of hands, how many of you have enough of his presence manifested in your life? Like you're good. Like I got all I can handle. God, I'm telling you, me and God. I don't need no more preaching. Nobody raised their hand. So what's that? What's that mean? What does that tell you? That tells you that there is more God has for you to experience in him. And this is why hunger is so important. For some of us, it's a matter of not knowing there's more. For some of us, it's a matter of not caring if there's more. For some of us, it's a matter of not wanting more. But God is beckoning us in this season to come deeper, to come closer, to experience more of me. Do you know that there is nothing to fear when it comes to God? There is nothing to fear, but we have a church age that is full of people who are literally afraid of the presence of God. And we have called demonic. So you mean to tell me that you believe a demon would show out like that, but God would not manifest himself in a way that is tangible. So you believe more in demonic power than you do the presence of the Lord. Many of us come into the house of God week after week and we never even open ourselves up to the presence of God. How many of you would be honest with me and say that there are times that you come into the house of God and you do not even open yourself to him? You're in the house. You're in the place of worship. But you're closed. How many of you would admit fear is what keeps you from going deeper? I see heads nodding. How many of us would admit that the way we live keeps us from going deeper? I don't mean in the sense that you can't go. I mean in the sense that you don't feel worthy. You don't, you don't feel worthy because of something in your life that's out of order. You don't feel worthy because of something in your life that's out of step. But do you know that if you were to get in the presence of God, what is difficult to break outside of the presence of God, in the presence of God can be broken in moments? And we labor and we struggle and we sweat and we lay hands on you at the altar and we cry out and call on the name of Jesus, plead the blood, speak in tongues, do all of this stuff. And you go by, you come up bound and you sit down bound because you never even opened yourself. But if you would learn that the tangible, physical manifested presence of God is available to you. See, you don't have rights to the presence because of your holiness. I'm just flowing with the Holy Ghost. 
You don't have rights to, it's not your holiness that gives you rights to enter in. It's the blood of Jesus. It's your faith in Jesus Christ that gives you rights to the presence of God. Through Jesus, in myself I can't approach him. But through Jesus, the book of Romans tells me that I can come boldly before the throne of grace. Wow. Come on, tell somebody, tell them, shift that mindset, shift it, shift it. You're missing out. You're missing out on experiencing the face of God, which has been made available to us through Jesus Christ. Come on, touch your neighbor, tap him, tell him God wants to show you his face. God wants to show you his face. That show my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. That shows you that we have had a dispensational change. Stop, stop teaching the glory that Moses saw. The glory that Moses saw was not the face of God because Jesus had not yet come. The glory that Moses saw was the hinder parts of God and it was a fading glory. But we now face the face. We now face to face have access to the glory and the presence of God. Ah, my God, Moses visage was changed and he only saw the back of God. What would happen to your life if you would allow yourself to become more acquainted with the face of God? I would dare to say that we would have to preach about less and that we would have to do less and that when we came into the house of God together because we've all been in his face and in his presence all week long that we all come together and corporately enter into the presence of God and experience realms and dimensions in God together. You would need less preaching and less convincing because that's all preaching is for some of us. We come in every week to be convinced. Hold on. Don't backslide. God is coming. God's going to help you. Rather than moving into deeper experiences with God. I just came to whet your appetite today. I didn't come today to go into the depths of the presence of God. I, I, I didn't. I, I, I came. I came to simply whet your appetite for more than what you are experiencing today. I come to tell you that there is more that you can't stop because you've seen his hand. You can't stop because you felt a chill bump. You can't stop because you felt a warmth. You can't stop because a tear ran down your face last week. You got to know that there is more of God that God wants to reveal to you. He wants to show you his face. He wants to show you his glory. In the presence, in the presence, in the presence. Of the Lord is the fullness of joy in the presence of the Lord. Well, what you need, you haven't found it because you've not gotten in the presence. I'm not talking about prayer because you pray doesn't mean you're in the presence. Because you sing a song doesn't mean you have gotten into the presence. Because you lift your hands doesn't mean you have gotten into the presence of God. When the presence of God shows up in a place, things visibly begin to change. Things begin, things begin to change. We must, we must, we must go deeper, but we will only go deeper as deep as our level of surrender. If you don't surrender, God is not a rapist. Oh, God, help me. God ain't just going to take it. 
Uh, some of you sense the presence of God come on and you immediately tense up scared to fall out scared to whatever the whatever God is trying to do at that moment I'm not saying that falling out is the only way to experience the presence but that does require surrender to the presence some of us <laughs> courtesy fall Like, maybe if I leave, he'll leave me alone. <laughs> Don't let the person minister until you start tapping on that thing. You just drop out. <laughs> That's why sometimes I like, pick him up, pick him up. Come on back here. <laughs> but there are times when the presence of God can be so intense that you can't stand. And some of us fight that dimension. Yes, yes, yes. You know, we kind of start to go there and then we come out. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Let me tell you, when God takes you into that dimension of experiencing his glory, he's doing surgery on you. Yeah. Why are you trying to rush out of the place where your breakthrough is? Work rush out of the place where if you're in God's face, that means you're in front of his mouth. In the presence of the Lord is where the Lord speaks. Jesus, you need direction. You don't know where your life is supposed to go. You don't know what decision to make. It's in the presence of God. in his presence where that's where his mouth that's where the mouth is that's where he can release revelation to you that's where he can release instruction to you that's where he can tell you leave that negro alone that ain't your husband mm. leave that woman alone that ain't your wife ah Jesus Jesus that's why we stay out of the presence of the Lord, like I said in the early service, because we love what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. And the closer you get to God, the more flesh has to die off. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. The more you're in the presence of God, the more dirty and naked you see yourself. And the more you begin to see your need for God. That's why many of us, that's why many of us don't really get deep into worship. Because you notice when you get deep into worship, God starts talking to you. Mm. He starts revealing stuff to you, not about your neighbor, not about your mama, not about your daddy, but about you. That's a little too intimate for us. That's a little too close for comfort. I'm not quite ready, old God, to deal with that. I'm not ready to give that up yet. So I'm going to live on the outer court. I'm going to live on the outskirts. But it's in the presence. It's in the presence that is the fullness of joy. It's not in the world, it's in the presence. It's not in your boo, it's in the presence. It's not in your glass or your bottle, it's in the presence. Oh God, this is what the scripture says when it says not to be drunk with wine. <laughs> it's got quiet in this Presbyterian church. <laughs> but to be filled with the spirit. If you were filled with the spirit, you wouldn't need substitute spirits. I don't need a substance to calm my nerves. I can get in his presence. God help me. Ah, oh God, I don't need a substance to, to calm my nerves, to, to calm me down, to, to get my mind right. In the presence of the Lord, in the face of the Lord, is the fullness of joy. My God, 
in the face of the Lord is where my depression is dealt with. In the face of the Lord is where my frustration is dealt with. In the face of the Lord, my God, is the fullness of joy. At his right hand. I told you, you can't get the blessing without the blesser. If you get the blesser, with the face comes the right hand. Y'all don't hear what I'm saying. With the face of God comes the right hand. What is the right hand? It is the provision of God. It is the blessing of God. It is the endorsement of God. It is the power of God. You got to give you up for this level of glory. Uh, I know you know how to have church, but do you know how to have glory? Uh, uh, I know you know how to sing. Here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. But do you know how to have glory? Do you know how to yield and surrender yourself totally and completely to the Lord? Do you know how to just let God have his way and take over in your life? Do you know how to let the glory of God invade your very being? God, get up in my cellular system. Get up in my mind. Get all around me. God, I need your glory. Your issue is not another word. That's not what you need. Your issue is not another principle. That's not what you need. You got principles that you're not working. Your issue is you need to experience God for real. That's the only thing that's going to set your life on the course that he designed for it to be on. When you yield your body and soul, you must understand that God wants all of you. He doesn't just want your intellect. He doesn't just want your mind. Many of us have no issues giving him our mind. And that's where you live, in your head. And you can't experience the things of the spirit in your head. You so busy trying to figure out what's going on. Hello. I know I'm in the house today. You so busy trying to compute and this doesn't make sense. And the reason and what should I be doing right now? Yielding. What should I be doing right now? Opening yourself. What's it going to feel like? Don't matter. What am I going to look like to people? Don't matter. Don't matter. As long as I'm in his face, I can look ugly. I can be tore up, knock me in the floor, roll me around. I don't care what you do, God. As long as when you're done with me, when I get up, I'm more like Jesus. When I get up, I'm delivered. When I get up, I'm set free. When I get up, I love people better. When I y'all don't hear what I'm saying. When I get up, depression is gone. As long as that happens, I don't care what I look like. I don't care what I look like. See, that's the problem for men. Oh, men don't worship like that. No, 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 men. Men, we need to stop being stubborn and proud yeah. and haughty yeah. and caring too much about not looking like a man. Yeah. There's nothing more manly than a man who will weep in the presence of God. There's nothing more attractive to a woman than a man who will lift his hands, than a man who is familiar with the presence of God. Oh, my God. If you get in the presence of God, you'll find a woman who's attracted to the. That's right. mm. Mm. If you live, if you learn how to live in his face, live in this presence, you will stop attracting bums. 
You'll stop attracting booty callers because they're not attracted to the glory. How many want his presence? Let me see your hands. I need to see if I'm in the room. How many want his presence?